right, hello. Um, I'm Susanna Herculana Wiesel. I am a biologist turned neuroscientist, and my favorite topic is diversity. Here you have a sample of mammalian brains, and they are shown to scale, meaning that uh, the one that appears to be really tiny is really tiny, the one that appears to be really large is really large. So here going from shrew brains to um, elephant brain, which is really the size of my forearm. And if you look at this bunch of brains, you can appreciate that there's diversity. They are not all the same. So if you are used to seeing these brains, you would be able to look at one of them and say, oh, this is the elephant brain, um, which by the way is this here. This is the elephant brain. And this is must be a tiny little shrew brain. And from the shape of the brain, I know that this is a carnivoran and I know that this is a primate. Um, so yes, there's all that diversity, but there's also repeating patterns that appear and that allow you to know a number of things about brains, even if you're not a uh, specialist on that. For instance, I've taken some of those brains here and uh, I blew them all up to appear to be the same size. The, but if you look at them, um, you realize that even though there's a sameness to them, they all look like brains and they all are mammalian brains, you realize that there are differences that allow you to guess, for example, um, if you were to guess which one is the smallest brain here and which one is the biggest one. Um, you probably look around for a little bit, look at a few different features, and I, my bet is you're gonna pick Either one of these two is the smallest one, and you're probably going to go for this here or this one, but probably this one is the biggest one. Maybe you don't even know what feature it is that allowed you to make that choice. In reality, what you've already noticed is that there is this thing called scaling, or that um, applies to, that means essentially that Objects, systems, beings, creatures come in all sorts of different sizes. And there are certain regularities that happen as size varies. That applies to bodies, that applies to cities, that also applies to brains. And so let's look at some of those regularities. One is what allows you to look at this image here and tell instantly that one of these stick figures is an adult human and the other one is a little child human, right? But then you could say, well, I'm, I have the, the I have a uh, key here, I, I see the size, I see that one is much smaller than the other one, so that's what it must be. But I can remove that and you'll still be able to tell who is the adult, I bet. And that is simply because of the proportions. So unknowingly, without studying, without doing the proper systematic um, data, data gathering and, and mathematical analysis, you know that there's something about proportions that changes with size. And that is the key to studying scaling, which is something, by the way, that people at the movies have learned that they have to pay attention to. Look at this Godzilla. Why is this Godzilla not really believable? What's wrong with this Godzilla? This, this Godzilla is, well, maybe too thick. I, I would say I cannot look at this Godzilla and not see a human dressed in a costume. The proportions are the proportions of a human, right? Um, so that just tells you that a giant creature, skyscraper high, cannot have the proportions of a, of a human. You somehow know that that's not right. How do you know that that's not right? Well, because your brain is very good at extracting pattern from the things that you interact with, so good that you can actually start paying attention to that and realize that there are patterns that you can understand and that you can use to make predictions and answer very important questions questions such as, could there be a Godzilla at all? And then you realize that uh, if you want to make a credible Godzilla that's 350 feet tall, you're looking at something that weighs two 
20,000 tons, meaning it's much, much larger than a blue whale, which is the largest thing that we, living thing that we know. Each thigh would have to be 100 feet across. Each leg would have to be 60 feet across. So you start getting the dimensions. You could say that uh, you can predict that it would have a tiny brain in what looks like a fairly tiny head, but it's still a two-ton brain. And you can start wondering, would that ever even be possible that somebody could, uh, that a, a brain that big could be built? Um, that's actually still nothing in comparison to how big the heart would have to, 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 to be to push around two million liters of blood. And uh, this is the clean part because, of course, if this animal existed, it would, like every other animal, need to pee and poop. And uh, we're looking at a small swimming pool of pee generated per day and a good truckload of poop, which thankfully does not appear in the movies, but there is a pattern. There's a numerical um, quantitative pattern behind these numbers um, that goes like this. Sometimes when you look at living things or actually even cities and populations and uh, things that... Uh, exist in many different sizes, you realize that uh, proportionalities like these apply. And what we're seeing here, well, the first one on the left is the simple one, whereas whenever x grows by a factor of 2, y grows by a factor of 2 also. And that's a linear proportion. Um, here you have uh, the, the same x series, and but and the, the one in the middle, you see that whenever x grows by a factor of 2, y grows by a factor of 4. And it doesn't matter where you apply that transformation. Here, you multiply 512 by 2, you get this. And the accompanying change is that this number gets multiplied by 4. Here, the same thing, but only but that now there's a, there's a factor of 8 for every factor of 2 in, in x. Um, what we have here that's so remarkable about these relationships is that if you plot them and if you look at the ratios between um, each, the size of each step in these relationships, they are all self-similar, meaning it doesn't matter if you're comparing this side of the range or that side of the range, the ratios will, uh, will remain will change in the, same, in the same way. And it's this systematic repetition that we call scale invariance. Now, there's something that comes in very handy about these, these uh, mathematical relationships, is that they are power laws. Um, they have, when the, so they, you have y that varies not simply proportionally to x, but proportionally to x raised to a certain exponent. If it's a, an exponent smaller than 1, then you have something that decreases very rapidly and keeps ever decreasing afterwards. If it's bigger than 1, you have the, the opposite. You have something that you have y that increases very, very, very fast with uh, much faster than, than x. Now, another very handy thing, and I'll, I'll be using this for the rest of the talk, is that um, you can take the, you can use the log transform of a power law and turn that into a linear relationship. That's very handy because you can plot that um, on a log-log scale and you get that relationship show up as a line that is much easier to, to work with. And by the way, this is a, a favorite trick of people um, in the early 1900s up to the late 1900s when computers were not available and you had to imagine that, plot your own graphs by hand. So it was much, much easier to plot lines on log paper or to plot log transformed values on linear paper than um, dealing with the actual log plots. So we know what kind of relationship we're looking at. And the some bottom lines here are that once you start once you become aware of this, those relationships and you start looking for them in the data, you realize that they are everywhere. Um, and what that means is that there's order 
to all this diversity that you look at. And it's not just order in biology or even physics, which is where everybody could expect it. Like I said, you find the same type of order to how communities are built and how communities uh, grow. How, how can you expect the amount of uh, water used by a city to scale depending on the number of people in that city? What can you expect to happen to traffic traffic jams, information flow. This type of scaling is self-similar with scale invariance, which means that uh, it doesn't matter whether you're looking at a community that's small or large, at a body or brain that's small or large, you know that at every single level, the same principles will hold, the same relationships will hold. And that is not because biological scaling is governed by power laws, as if somebody decreed this is what's going to apply, biological creatures organize yourselves this way. No, it's the other way around. It's because uh, the fact that these relationships exist and they are um, power, explained by power laws, that tells us that there's a lot about physics and biology and complex systems that are self-similar, meaning that they, can, they, they must grow, for example, through the addition of modules that retain similar properties, and the, the, so the whole grows in a self-similar way. That can be described mathematically by power laws. Once you have those power laws, what do you do with that? Well, um, and actually, how do you find out where you have these power laws? Well, you can start by, quite simply, just looking around. So I'll show you work that a colleague of mine, David Hu at Georgia Tech University um, did. Um, he was interested by the question of um, what determines how much pee different animals produce. And the, his, there's several ways in which you could get interested in that uh, question. Let me offer you one. Think of all the times in the day that you have to stop what you're doing because you really have to go. Now, imagine that you really had to go a thousand times more per day. Maybe you would get to the point where there's no free time left really to do anything else because um, that's how much urine your body is producing. So this is a fair and interesting, even if quite weird, question to ask. How, what do we know about how much P different species produce and how that scales? What can we find out about the scaling relationship that applies there. So what he did was um, invite a bunch of undergraduate students to go to the zoo with, in Atlanta with um, not even cameras, just their phones with their own cameras and video, just film people, fi film uh, different animals and how long it took them to void their bladders. And what he found out was that um, it turns out that uh, larger animals take only a little bit more time than smaller animals every single time that they have to pee. It's about 21 seconds. Uh, yeah, I probably got you thinking that you're going to time yourself the next time you go. <laughs> um, and you'll you realize that, uh, yes, it varies a little bit, but uh, and that's where systematic observation comes in. It's very important to make sure that you're always timing from a full bladder, for instance. Um, but um, this also translates into a similar about 20 minutes per day for every single species, which is not a whole lot. It's still pretty feasible. And um, you realize that that is because the urinary system turns out to scale isometrically. So isometric scaling is a particular type of power law scaling in which the proportion, proportions are always kept the same, meaning the shape of the system never changes, meaning a, a urinary system, a urinary tract, it has essentially the same shape and the same proportions in a small or a very large animal. There are some very, very important real life um, consequences to whether something scales isometrically, 
so with similar proportions, or allometrically with changing proportions, like the proportions of the body, for instance. What you're looking at here is me looking at a gigantic fossil that's about 600 million years old. And this is really interesting because we know that life starts out small as, as single cells, but as soon as life becomes multicellular, as soon as you have now systems built by cells coming together and working together, life instantaneously in evolutionary um, terms becomes gigantic. So you have this, this whole thing here, each of them that looks like a, a motorcycle tire track. Each of them is one being that just grew to become very, very large. How is that possible? Well, um, if you investigate a little bit, you find out that um, this is supposedly the first fo form of multicellular life that appeared once an ensheathing membrane or a basal membrane appeared that encased that population of cells into some sort of a, uh, an internal environment. Now the thing is, um, and the key here, is that those beings, to the best of our knowledge from the fossil record, they were flat. And when you're flat, you scale, when, when, you, when you're flat and you grow like a sheet of paper that you have there, if that, when that piece of paper grows, its surface grows by the same amount as its volume, if the thickness is not changing, right? So that means that there's no internal constraint to size. And that is a very simple possible explanation for how come the very first forms of multicellular life on Earth was, were very big so fast in contrast to the forms of life that come right afterwards that uh, seem to have shrunk to smaller sizes. They're much more variable in shape but they're also smaller in, in size. And what happened here, the, the one key difference between those first life forms and, the, and these ones from the Cambrian is that now you're looking at three-dimensional life. You're looking at beings that have, have gained an internal cavity. It's like that sheet of paper that you have over there just popped up in the third dimension and it became, it just gained that third dimension. And now when that sheet of paper that became, just became a brick, as it becomes bigger, you, you can do some very basic math and realize that its volume starts growing much faster than the surface. So whatever processes for, uh, whatever functions for these creatures depend on surface area, like uh, maybe breathing oxygen through the skin or exchanging fluid through the skin, that is going to happen much more slowly than the, their needs that increase with the size of the, the animal. So you start seeing constraints. That means that uh, scaling in life is not simply something that happens. It, there not only seem to be some rules, some patterning to how that happens. Um, there also seem to be constraints, limits to um, what is possible in life. For instance, the, we do see a huge variety of sizes in brains, but also the bodies that come around them. Um, and you might think that um, life should be really, really easy when you are a tiny little creature, um, and it should also be very easy for different reasons when you're a very, very large animal. It turns out that once you start understanding, when you, once you look closer at what happens, what types of changes happen systematically as animals uh, vary in size, you, you realize that hummingbirds have some serious problems. Their, um, their metabolism is very high, but their mouths are very small, and the food that they eat is fairly low calories. So that means that a hummingbird has to be eating every single second it's awake pretty much. Um, if it doesn't get enough calories, it's going to enter into torpor, and if things don't get solved by the next day, if they don't get fixed by the next day, that's probably going to be it for the, for the hummingbird. Um, 
whales on the other side, they have very low metabolic rates, but because their size is so large, they still have to spend pretty much most of their uh, waking hour, uh, hours looking for food. And temperature regulation becomes a problem. When you're very, very high, you produce, you still produce enough um, heat that if you live at a warm environment, you might just cook up from the inside. So there are restrictions to how, how size scales. And something that I'll come back to in just a little bit when we start talking about brains is that um, the, there were, thankfully, these uh, a handful of guys in the 1930s to 1950s who were um, tasked with understanding what is the most productive way to raise farm animals for the agriculture department. And one of the things that they realized that they had to understand was, okay, what is the relationship between how large an animal is and how much energy it consumes and also how much uh, meat, let's say, that animal produces. So the, the practical, very practical question here was, is it more economical to raise small animals like chicken um, or even, I don't know, ducks, pigs, or to raise large animals like cows? Um, and here what they, is when they realized that um, the amount of energy that an animal uses scales with, it scales up together with the size of the body. Yes, which this part is intuitive. The larger an animal is, the more energy it uses. The part that was not intuitive is that this is a power law with an exponent that is smaller than one, meaning you're, you become a uh, hundred times bigger, you do not use a hundred times more energy. You use a little bit less than that. Um, there's a number of questions that you realize that uh, you, you have and you just didn't know that you have once you look at something like this. How come? Why is the exponent 0.75? How come you, you don't get a uh, metabolic rate increasing together just proportionally with the size of the body? And there are physicists who dedicate their lives to examining these questions. Jeff West is one of them. And um, his um, theory, his explanation for how metabolism scales has to do with, again, these power laws that govern scaling, finding that when you look at the, the vasculature, the system that distributes blood throughout your body, you realize that it scales like a fractal, like a, um, a self-similar system that always branches and up in a similar way, always ends up occupying as much um, of the volume of the tissue as it could, let's say, based on these invariant terminal units. Um, and he proposes then that uh, metabolic rate can be understood simply as a consequence of that physical property of vasculature. So met uh, metabolic rate is a consequence of the network distribution of vessels constrained to body mass. So the idea here is that uh, body mass is set up somehow and that defines the shape, the architecture of your vascular system and that in consequence uh, defines how much energy you use per time, which has another really important um, implication for life in general that you see here. If you look at the ratios uh, of how much time different things about life take, the lifespan, cardiac cycle, so the frequency of your heartbeats, the, the um, respiratory, uh, the frequency of your respiration, you, what you see here is that even when animals vary by um, a million times in size, it looks like some things, and that's what we call life history, the aspects of life history that are related to time are truly universal. So this is what you find in textbooks today, that all animals live the same amounts of metabolic time. So um, there are these really interesting estimates that it doesn't matter what 
kind of warm-blooded animal you, you look at, they all have between one and two billion heartbeats in them to live, which makes listening to your own heartbeat quite troubling, because you just go one less, two less, three less, four less. Uh, the, but here's the idea that a slow-burning flame um, burns longer. So this has a really important consequence for understanding longevity. And maybe you've, you have asked yourselves, how come we humans get to live close to 100 years when a mouse never lives more than just two years, doesn't matter how um, well treated they, they are. Um, so the, the logic according to this theory of metabolic scaling is that um, it's really that, that uh, a slow burning flame burns longer. Um, as you use energy, you also suffer damages to your body and therefore the faster your up a body uses energy, the faster it should also accumulate damages and therefore the faster you would expect it to reach that point where it's th the system is just too mangled, too broken down to keep functioning well. So if you apply that to a large database, um, so you see that thankfully there are other people out there who go through the trouble of digging through the literature and collecting data on thousands of different species so then somebody can use those data and put them together and ask these questions, you see that, well, yes, there is a measurable correlation, uh, significant correlation, between how slowly a gram of tissue burns energy across species and how long, what's the maximum amount of time that you can find that species to live. So here you see that expected relationship that uh, animals that use energy more slowly, they tend to live longer lives, right? Um, now, measuring metabolic rate is something that's very hard, but once you realize that, uh, like I, that relationship that I just showed you before, but now you have more data here, once you realize that there is a very, very good indeed relationship between how large the body is and how quickly or slowly that animal uses energy, since this relationship is much better, you can start using body mass now to predict how much different animals are gonna live, and you get the relationship that you would expect. You get a positive relationship, so what we have here is that the larger the animal is, the longer it tends to live. What this R square of 0.32 here means is that variations in body mass explain 0.32 times 100%, meaning 32% of variation in longevity, which is reasonable. It's significant, there is a correlation there, but there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of something else going on. Actually, body mass, it doesn't even explain half of the variation in, that you have in longevity, which means there has to be something else going on. Now, the other thing, and this is interesting too because uh, this is where we see a very direct and practical effect of changes in technologies, because when the first graphs like these were plotted, it was either by hand or with very, very simple computers that did everything in black and white. After black and white came shades of gray, but still you have everybody, you're looking at everybody as if they were all um, balls in the same bag. Once you have color, once you have the possibility of color coding your data, of respecting differences and representing those differences in there, you realize that there's, there's more going on than you had uh, thought. You realize that uh, here you have all birds in black, all primates in red, and every other mammal except for bats here in pink. And you realize that if you take a one kilogram animal, if it's a bird, it lives much more than a primate, and a one kilogram primate in turn lives much more than any other mammal. So 
the logical conclusion here is body mass cannot be the determinant of longevity. Otherwise, these animals here would always live a similar amount of time. You also realize that uh, if you compare humans to everybody else, we sure look like we're outliers. Compared to a generic warm-blooded animal of a certain body mass, it certainly looks like humans are off the scale. Um, now, if you instead remember that humans are primates and we should be compared to primates, then things look much different than maybe humans are actually just where you would expect a generic primate to be. Now the question is, what is actually going on here? What is the thing that determines how long uh, an animal lives? And this is where we're gonna start talking about brains because when I saw this graph, when I got this uh, database, plotted that first all gray graph, which is what everybody looked at, and then because of my own personal bias of looking at diversity in group specific ways, I color coded these graphs. This here, birds on top of primates on top of everybody else, is a pattern that I had seen before. And I'll, I'll show you how we, get, well, how we got there, but this is, the, this is the pattern that I knew. For a similar body mass, birds always have more neurons in the cortex than primates, which in turn always have more neurons in the cortex than any other mammal. So you look at these two things, you go back and forth, and you just think this is too good to be just coincidence. You have the same pattern here and there, question, do you actually have a direct correlation between these two things? So we'll get there, but before we get there, let me just um, tell you uh, uh, another story on what we knew about how different brains are built and uh, what turns out to actually be the case. So you look at brain diversity and the operating idea had for a long time been that Brains are all built the same way. A brain is a brain is a brain. If you take two brains of a similar size, they're probably gonna be made of similar numbers of neurons organized in a similar way. If you take one brain that's bigger than another one, the bigger brain is gonna have more neurons that are also bigger neurons. Um, and there were also a number of ideas that came along with the, the concept of brain scaling. First, that larger animals have larger brains. And the idea for a very long time was that um, it must take a bigger brain to run a bigger body, which kind of makes sense from a biological point of view. The interesting thing is ask a bio uh, biomechanicist or an engineer or a computational scientist, and they'll look at the same question and, and say, no, it doesn't make sense. If the number of joints is the same, if the body organization is still very much the same, why should it take more neurons? Why should it take more brain to run that bigger body? Still, this, is, this was the idea. Like I said, there was also the idea that all brains are built the same way, so with more neurons that are also bigger. Um, and in comparison to that, you, you realize that when, when, when you put birds and uh, mammals side by side, like here, you realize that systematically, bird brains are much smaller than mammalian brains. You can ask yourself, how come? Something that probably springs to mind very rapidly is, well, they fly, maybe there's a strong constraint to having much very big brains because otherwise you wouldn't be able to fly. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. That's still an open question, by the way. Um, there was also this idea that the cerebral cortex, the top part of the brain, that, uh, is, that's where you find the circuits that take all the information that your brain receives from the body and from the outside and allows you to create new combinations, allows your behavior to become really complex and flexible and much, much, much more than simply detecting stuff on the outside and reacting to it. So it's your cortex really that gives you a past and a future beyond just living in the, in the present. Um, the idea was that in evolution, as brains scale up, the cortex is the part that becomes uh, largest 
uh, faster. So you would have really uh, growth of the, the cortex by just imagine that uh, that sheet of paper is your cortex and you, you're pulling it sideways at, as it expands. The thickness never changes very much, only the surface area changes and underneath each little square of uh, paper you have a certain number of neurons. The more you pull it, the more neurons you have. And also these brains start getting folded as that, sh as that sheet grows. Imagine that uh, you just threw a towel into your laundry hamper and that towel started growing inside the laundry hamper. There's only one way for it to grow. It has to start folding itself it, as it accommodates to the constraint in size. Um, but here's the thing. What I, I, I realized be because I was looking for the original data uh, the original numbers behind each of these notions, that they were actually mostly intuitions based on very little real data. Um, one of the main reasons was that it was very hard to count neurons and to figure out how many neurons build uh, brains and cortices of the different species. They were either intuitions or they were these self-fulfilling prophecies that took all animals to scale the same way. And the reason for that is, this is that graph that I showed you of brain mass and how it scales, how it increases with the size of the body. Imagine that you, you paint all these data points gray. You could still convince yourself that there's this one universal relationship that applies through, uh, to all of them and the bigger an animal is, the larger it brain, its brain uniformly is so it's very easy especially when you're when you're working with scaling especially over many orders of magnitude it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking that there's a universal relationship um, without digging in through the through the, the details of what the tissue actually is like we needed a way to figure out how many neurons different brains were made of, and that is where brain soup came in as a simple way to get that done. Um, I really do refer to this method as brain soup. You make soup because that's really what you're doing. I'll show you in, in, a, in a second. Um, to publish this, we needed some kind of more formal and pompous name. Otherwise, editors would just frown at us and say, you, I'm not publishing a paper on brain soup. Find some other, some other name. But uh, really, that's what it is because you start with fixed tissue, you dissolve the membranes in detergent until you end up with just a cell nuclei. I remember from biology class that every cell has one and only one nucleus. So if you do away with the cell membranes, you end up with just cell nuclei. And that is very handy because now the cells are not fixed into place anymore. Those, they, they only, they're reduced to their nuclei and their nuclei slosh around and you can just um, mix that solution, which is actually now a suspension, make it homogeneous. And now that means that, so the proper term for a uh, homogeneous suspension is isotropic. So you make that isotropic and you, t you can take samples to the microscope and at each sample will be representative of the whole. So you start with your brain of interest, you cut it into the parts of interest. It really looks like a, a cooking recipe. You chop those parts down so that you can put, put them in that uh, glass tube where you crush them with uh, the salty detergent and that's what you end up with. You end up with a certain volume of soup that once you apply the dye, you can very easily count how many, how many nuclei and therefore how many cells were there in the tissue, making this simple one assumption that every nucleus corresponds to one cell, not zero, not two, just one cell. Um, so you can count the nuclei. You can also use cell type specific dyes and determine, I'll just flip back and forth here. You can determine what fraction of all those nuclei were actually neuronal. Um, if you start convincing enough people to arrange to have you get brains of different species, you can apply that method. You can turn brains of, of dozens of species into soup, and that's really important. 
because it's only once you have a huge variety of animals to look at, of brains to look at, that any pattern that exists will actually emerge um, to your eye. Question number one was, if all brains were made the same way, then two cortices um, up of the same size should have similar numbers of neurons, and a larger cortex should always have more neurons than a smaller one. But here we have um, giraffe and a monkey brain. You see how the, 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 the monkey is much smaller than the giraffe. Its brain is also much smaller than the giraffe brain. And yet, both of them have similar numbers of neurons in the cortex. Things get even more extreme once you have numbers for how many neurons you find in the cortex of a human and in the cortex of an elephant. Even though the elephant cortex, and that, that by the way is my two jars here. So here we have a half quarter jar that's about the size of an elephant cortex hemisphere. And here we have, uh, this, so that's the half gallon, this is the quart gallon jar. And this is the size of, a human, of a, an elephant cortical hemisphere. This is the size of a human cortical hemisphere. So this is evidently twice the size of the other one. But it turns out that we have three times as many neurons in the cortex as the elephant does. Even though the size, the overall size of that cortex is smaller, how can that be true? What's necessarily the case here? The only way I can have more neurons inside this smaller cortex is if it turns out that the average neuron here is much, much smaller, actually about 30-something times smaller than the average neuron in the elephant cortex. Now, figuring that out is one thing, but that poses another question. Is that because this brain here happens to be different from every single other brain? So is this because, is this difference, do we have more neurons simply because we are the coolest species on Earth and we were singled out to become the ones with a gazillion neurons? Or is there some pattern behind this that we, we're not recognizing here? That's where you need plenty of species. And that's where if you insist on turning brain after brain after brain into soup, you realize each dot here is one species. Primates are in red, and this is our data point. So if you compare humans to everybody else, you, here you have the size of the, the cerebral cortex, the mass, and how it varies with the number of neurons that you found in that uh, cerebral cortex. You realize that if you compare the human cortex to the cortex of any non-primate mammal, it certainly looks extraordinary, literally. It looks like an outlier, but, we're not any mammal, we're primates, and we know that. So the proper comparison is to primates, and there you realize that uh, primates, primate cortices are built in a different way. And um, what we have, that different way is uh, indicated here. What you're looking at is the inverse of size, and simply because measuring the size of a cell is something very difficult to do, because neurons are very uh, funny-shaped cells, uh, and they can actually be very large. But measuring the density is very, very easy. So all I have to do to determine the density of neurons in this jar is knowing the volume of the jar and knowing how many little pompons I have here. That's the density. And the inverse of density tells me the size of the neuron. So what you have here is that if you're not a primate, the more neurons you have in your cortex, the lower the density, meaning the bigger the average neuron is. But if you are a primate, then you have a much shallower um, curve, you have a much shallower increase in numbers of neurons. And actually, there's, even though we can't go back in time, we don't have a time machine to investigate the brains of the first mammals, we know from the fossil record that the very first mammals were tiny little creatures with tiny little brains and therefore tiny little cortices. And because this relationship here applies to all these different types of mammals, even not, though not for primates, the parsimonious thing to presume is that if the same relationship applies today to all these different creatures, it probably already applied 200 million years ago when this creature lived.
So we'll never know for sure, we'll never have its brain in our hands, but we can infer with quite good certainty that this is how many neurons that species has had, and they were tiny little neurons. All right. Um, we also find that compared to mammals, birds are actually cooler, if by cooler, what you, what you mean is having even more neurons crammed into the same tiny space. So you see here that for a similar cortical mass, birds systematically have more neurons than primates in red than everybody else. And that is because the first birds probably had very high densities of neurons, so tiny little neurons. And as birds increased in size and gained more neurons in the cortex, the average size of that neuron never increased. One bottom line here that I want to draw your attention to is that there are multiple ways of putting a cortex together. There are multiple ways of putting the volume of the cortex together. There's the primate way, there's the bird way, and there's the non primate mammalian way. Now, once you have that volume, it turns out there are multiple ways of distributing that volume in three dimensions. You can take the same volume and spread it thinly over a very large surface or have it spread very thickly, so hardly at all, over a, um, a much smaller surface. And that's what you realize here. You see that uh, for each color, so each different type of mammal, you have a different relationship between how thick that cortex is depending on how large it has become. And the consequence is that neurons become distributed in completely different ways under that uh, surface or through that thickness in what we can propose as a, the, the, the visual analogy here is a, a jam and cracker model of cortical evolution or of, of spreading neurons in the cortex where um, what maybe all it takes to generate this diversity is you need something that determines how many neurons you have and how large the average neuron is, so how much fruit do you have in your jam. And then there must be something that determines how thickly or thinly that volume of jam is spread. So um, it turns out, and we can, we can build a, the, a mathematical model that uh, based on based on just three variables, so two variables that determine how many neurons you you get formed um, in this direction and so tangentially and radially, and a third variable that determines how large the average neuron is, you can actually write every single variable here in green that defines morphologically, that describes a cerebral cortex, you can write those in green as functions, actually pr pretty simple functions of those variables in, in red, and you can predict very, very nicely, this, what you're looking at here is that the, the deviation, for the, what, what we actually find for all these brains deviates by typically not more than 10 or 15% from what we can predict from that very, very simple uh, system of um, equations with just three variables. So um, you, the, the fact that you have equations that are consistent with the data means that the data are well accounted for, they are well described, and you have a way to describe cortical diversity by through this variation of um, through changes in just those three variables so the idea was that a bigger cortex should uh, have more neurons and than a smaller one I already told you that that's not true the, this bigger cortex because it's become it's grown to become larger it should also be more folded than a smaller cortex now, once we had the numbers, we could test that. And so what you would, what you, ex the, the, the prediction was that every single data point should be clustered here around one single um, straight line. And you see that that's clearly not the case. There's at least two relationships. There's maybe even more different relationships because you, you have different slopes over here. The point is you can find 
a brain that um, has 10 times as many neurons as another one, but they're equally folded. And you can find one that has fewer neurons and is actually more folded than another one. That's the case of the elephant. Okay, what do I mean by folded? Um, so we've come to those sheets of papers that you found waiting for you on your, your seats. Um, could you please take that uh, just one sheet and just crumple it up as hard as you can. Just turn it, just apply. So what you're doing here is applying pressure to it unevenly. You're doing this in some kind of way. It really doesn't matter how, as long as you're not just squeezing the sheet. What you realize is that that sheet now became this, right? And um, where's most of the surface of that sheet? Where is it? It's, it's not on the outside, it's now buried on the inside, right? So this is what we call folding. This is what we, ref when, when we say the cortex is folded, this is what we're talking about, that when you look at a cortex, most of its surface is not exposed at the surface, it's hidden inside. And the um, one lingering question for decades had been, how does that happen? What determines how folded a cortex is? Um, because it turns out that uh, folding serves very nicely as a mechanism that reduces the volume for a certain uh, surface area. Let me say in another way, when you have a folded surface, when you allow, when you have the possibility of having surface on the inside of this crumpled paper ball, I can actually fit much more surface area in this ball than if it were a balloon, right? with a perfectly smooth surface on the outside. So how does that happen? Is it something that evolved? Well, this is where Bruno Mata, my, my physicist friend, um, came in um, again, and he looked at the, I posed the question to him, and I, I told him, I know it's not the number of neurons. I know that this has something to do with simply the surface area and the thickness. I don't know how. And Bruno is that kind of person that once you feed him a problem, he cannot think about anything else. So I've, I've learned to offer him new questions very, very judiciously. And uh, once he had this new one to work on, he figured out that, uh, well, if you consider the physics of a surface that is self-avoiding, meaning as you crumple that sheet of paper, the paper does not fuse together, right? Meaning it's not silly putty. It's a self-avoiding surface that develops under a series of pressures that we know happen during development. Then it turns out that you can predict that there will be a particular conformation, a particular combination of total surface area and exposed surface area that is the one that minimizes the amount of free energy that that volume has. That's a very fancy way for saying that apply energy unevenly to a body and you're gonna find that it settles down at the most stable conformation. Just like you toss a marble down the drain, it's gonna end down the drain because that's where um, energy has reached the minimum. It also turns out that there is a very simple um, equation that describes, that predicts the relationship between the total surface area of that sheet, the thickness of that sheet, and what the exposed surface area of the most stable conformation will be. And once we realized that we had that, we had two things to do. One was test this relationship and see if it applied to our brains, regardless of number of neurons. And two, if this is really a physical property of any self-avoiding surface uh, that folds under pressure, um, then I should be able to make, to test this by making paper balls of different sizes, of different surface areas and different thicknesses. And 
This is my dining room table. This is the balls that were measured and ended up in our science paper, figure 3B. I'm so proud of that. Um, the, so those color data points are those paper balls on my dining table. And I can have you guys convince yourselves of what happens here. So what we're going to see is the effect of having a very, very slight increase in thickness of that one sheet of paper. So I just asked you to crumple up one sheet of paper. Um, now I want to ask you to crumple up paper that is three times as thick. How do we do that? Stack three sheets of paper and crumple it up, all right? Make sure that you have them nicely stacked up so it really looks, acts like one sheet that is three times as thick. Go to town. Just fold it as hard as you can. Apply pressure. You see that it's much harder already? Compare your results. Does thickness make a difference? Oh, yeah. Um, and it's much more than you would expect from what looks like a tiny little effect. So it turns out that when you look at, um, when you get the real data and you apply that equation, you find that the cortex folds just exactly as you would uh, predict for even a sheet of paper, meaning at the folding, the degree of folding is really a physical property. All right, so let's finish up where we started. Um, talking about scaling across individuals and uh, across species and this um, enormous diversity that has, however, some order to it, and what it has to do with what can it inform about that other prediction that we had about how long different animals live. So I've showed you that um, there is also diversity in how brains go into bodies. You can have these three bodies of different, of sim similar sizes, and the bird always has more neurons in the primate than everybody else. So the next question is, does this clade-specific difference, meaning does this difference between groups account for those differences in how long different animals live? And so the question is, if instead of plotting maximal longevity as a function of body mass, if we plot it as a function of the number of neurons in the cortex, do those differences go away? And the answer is yes. Not only they go away, and now you have 72%, uh, so most, uh, more than half of that variation in longevity is accounted for by the number of, by this diversity in the number of neurons. Guess where the human data point is? Right here. We are not outliers anymore. So it turns out that once there is a variable that accounts very, very nicely for something as diverse as how long different animals can live, and humans are not just a primate, not just a mammal, but just what you would expect for any warm-blooded animal. Scaling is about much more than simply recognizing that there is diversity. Scaling begins with realizing that there often is order to that diversity. And that's really important because it allows you to make predictions. Predictions that sometime let you, sometimes let you go back in, in time and make predictions about animals that you will never see. Predictions that sometimes allow you to um, make hypotheses that you can then go check out if they're true or not. And that's one major way of learning things. And then you learn that, for instance, some aspects of diversity or constrained by physics. A cortex is always folded to the same extent that you can predict from the physics of pressures applied to a um, self-avoiding surface of a, cer a certain thickness. Whereas on the other hand, I showed you that you can build a similar volume of cortex or even a similar surface of cortex in oh so many different ways. There's not one simple way of building systems. There's not one simple single way of building life. And yet there's order to all of this diversity. And the key is acknowledging both those things that diversity exists and it's 
often much, much, much more than we suspect it to be, and that there are hidden patterns behind all that diversity, that all it takes is a suspicion and the will to gather data and look at it, preferably with mathematical tools. Thank you so much for your attention.